continuing with the second portion of section seven for equations. Uh, towards the back, we're gonna see variables. We'll see radicals that we're solving uh, and that type of setup. We'll also conclude with absolute value. So on the side here for these three problems, I'm sketching out notes that I think are gonna be helpful for these types of problems. Uh, we're being asked to solve this equation where we have a radical square root of 6x minus 2. And this should be equal to x plus 1, which is outside the radical. So with the steps here, I think following these will be helpful, especially if you're a fan of going step by step. So isolating the radical, we want to have the radical just on its own, isolated. And when we say it's isolated, meaning it's just the square root left over on its own. There's no number here in front. There's just material in the radical, and that's it. That's crucial. So that's what it means by isolating the radical. There's no coefficient. We just want to add the radical. And so if we look at this, this is already done for us. So luckily, this first step, we can say, is over. Uh, from here, if we square both sides, so to get rid of the radical, we can square both sides. So when we square a square root, that just leaves us with the material inside. So what do you think is going to be left here? If we square it, the left side. So hopefully you're just saying 6x minus 2. And how about the right side? How's this going to change? Because we can square this, but what should we really be doing? Would we want to distribute 2 to these two terms or do something else? So hopefully you're thinking of using box method or FOIL to take this further. If you need a refresher on this, please check the previous videos or examples or practice that I'm sure we've been doing in class previously. Uh, this should then get us six, sorry, x squared plus 2x plus 1. So we've successfully squared both sides. And so now from here, it's an issue with solving. And we can use our best judgment if factoring seems feasible. This involves moving all three terms to one side. So that would involve using all of the terms to one side. And so with the quadratic formula, if you know how to complete the square, you could try that too. So with this, I'm going to keep x squared positive. So I'll keep these three terms as is. If we move 6x and the negative 2 by deducting and then adding 2, this will then leave us with 0 on the other side with x squared, 2x minus 6x gets us negative 4x, and then plus 3. So we're factoring to solve. We set up diamond method. We're looking for a product of 3 and a sum that's negative. Since our product is positive, our terms are going to have to be negative and negative. 3 is a prime number, so the factors here are 3 and 1. So we can rewrite this as x minus 3, x minus 1, using the zero product property, which if you need a refresher, check the previous video. Uh, we end up with x minus 3 equals 0, x minus 1 equals 0. Solving this, we can say that x equals 3 or positive 1. And we could always plug back in and check. If we go for problem 5, this should look like something you've seen in physics where there are a lot of variables floating around and you're being asked to solve for one in specific variable. So anytime you're solving for a variable, I think it's a good rule of thumb to kind of use the opposite order of operations because this should look like PEMDAS, but now we're going to be working backward. And I think this is a good rule of thumb uh, because the steps that you take here can be a little tricky. So the first step is if we're solving for R2, this is the money right here. 
This is the retweet that gets you famous. This is everything. We're trying to get this isolated. So we eventually want to have R2 equals a bunch of stuff. So to try and dig this out of the hole that it's in with parentheses and these terms on the outside, is there anything we can subtract from the right hand side? Anything that is being added and that we can get rid of that's outside the parentheses? So there's not too much, so we'll say that that's no good. Is there anything we can add? Well, there's nothing we can add because everything is pretty tight together here with these multiplying, these three terms. This pi, this L, and the sum of these are in parentheses, so this is kind of like another product, kind of like an entity. So addition's no good. So if we go with division, is there anything that is on the outside of parentheses that we don't want? So pi and L, we want to get rid of those because this is hindering us from breaking out R2. And the only way we can do this is by dividing. So we can acknowledge that pi and L are outside the parentheses. So if we divide both sides by pi and L, pi and L will cancel. This then leaves us with S over pi L equals now R1 and R2. So we use division here. So this was just to try and isolate our term. And now from here, we just have the sum of R1 and R2. We're solving for R2. So we should just be deducting R1 from both sides. keeping in mind that R1 is going to stay away from the fraction. The fraction's done. So we're deducting R1 as a whole type of entity. We see that R2 is now isolated, so that matched up with our goal we set here, so we're in good shape now. If we take this further for 5, this is solving this absolute value equation where we're going to be isolating the absolute value. We're then going to be checking for two answers. So if we isolate this absolute value, getting rid of this 3, we have the absolute value of 2x minus 4 equals 5. put two answers as an exclamation point, but also a question mark because sometimes the answers won't work if we plug them back in, and we might see that here, but we'll double check. So we're saying that there is going to be an absolute value of 2x minus 4 that could be equal to 5, keeping in mind that absolute value measures the distance to 0 on the number line. So the way we check this is if we have 2x minus 4 equals positive 5, and we also check the equation 2x minus 4 equals negative 5. So if we solve these, adding 4, adding 4, 2x now equals 9. So x equals 9 halves is one of our answers. We solve for the other side. We have 2x equals negative 5 plus 4, so negative 1. Dividing both sides by 2 gets us x equals negative 1 half. And so let's check this, because sometimes with problems like this, this can be a little iffy. And if you got to this point and you know how you got your work, that's good. So if we check to see if these two answers work, if we check the absolute value of 2 times 9 halves, minus 4 if it equals 5. 2 times 9 halves would give us 9. 9 minus 4 definitely gives us absolute value 5. All right, so we've got one answer that's definitely credible. This 9 halves is good to go. It goes back and it gives a logical statement. If we try with negative 1 half, 
absolute value of 2 multiplying with negative 1 half, deducting 4, this should be equal to 5, 2 times negative 1 fourth is negative 1. And so what do you think? If we have negative 1 minus 4, is this a logical statement? Should be saying yeah, because absolute value measures distance. So we always want a positive value, even if the inside's negative. So with this one, we do have two answers. So x can be equal to 9 halves or negative 1 half. So lots going on on this. Uh, the steps hopefully should help. I think where I see students trip up the most is with problems like this. They get worried because there are no numbers here, or maybe with the subscript of R1 and R2. And this might make you think of physics, which is understandable, because that can be a little intimidating, going back to working with just variables. Hopefully the steps have been helpful. Of course, if you have any questions on this section, please email me, ask a question in class, let me know.